we're going to announce the launch of Revival Today Church. We're going to hold Holy Ghost Church services every Sunday morning. We're going to give you and your family a place you can go that's a soul winning church that values the presence of God, where you can get prayed for and ministered to, where there's not a critical race theory lecture or a mass and social distancing, 10 minutes of no talking to anybody in the lobby. None of that. We're going to have a place where you're free and where you're free to experience the presence of God. Get ready for the greatest year that you've ever had in Jesus' mighty name. God has a live, powerful, fire-filled church on planet Earth. And the best days of the church are not behind it. The best days are still to come. You're not walking in to a year of defeat. You're going to be a part of the greatest victory that this planet has ever seen. I hear the sound of the armies of the Lord. I am standing here today looking at the men and women who are going to terrorize the devil before Jesus comes back. I'm looking at the men and women who are going to rise up in the anointing and show that the God of breakthrough is not dead. completely uh, crippled. Um, four surgeries, trying to heal a detached retina. Like I can't eat. Uh, four years of this pain and throwing up. <laughs> in 2017, we had found out he had a tumor. They wanted to do an operation because they had 90% block, or 80% blockage in my heart. And I didn't want them to do it because they tried killing me the first time. They tried doing that, putting in a stent. I, uh, I was born with muscular dystrophy, a rare form. There's 43 different forms. Um, and mitochondrial disease, which is a genetic defect in every cell of your body. But that man has not had a breath without assistance in over a decade. Blood disease, liver disease, kidney disease, any disease. They brought unto him all the sick. And no matter what their sickness or what their disease, he healed them all. He left here, took the oxygen off of his nose. I looked at her and said, I can see all those holes. Air tests, and they said, your respiratory function is above anything that we can imagine. It was the last day that I used a walker. Yes, I just believed it. And it happened. Just his words were so powerful. They just grew me. When you touched me, it felt like when they gave me the injection with the stuff to go through to see what the arteries would block. It just all ran through, just hot as it could be. And he saw that the tumor was gone. Completely gone, there's nothing there. The tumor looks like it's healed. The bone looks completely healed, like nothing was even there. There was no surgery that ever happened or anything on that bone. You've already won the victory. Hallelujah! Shout it out, I've already won! And God will do two things tonight. That demon that's assigned to your life, he'll pick him up and throw him out of here. And then he'll minister his power to your body. I came to get this message to the people. And no devil in hell is going to stop it. But when you stand up straight with your shoulders back and have a clean look in your eye, the fire of God down in your spirit, and he sees that you know who you are, the devil will back off for free. I prophesy in the name of Jesus Christ, every demon spirit assigned to your life, it backs off for free today in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, hello.
Hello there, Jonathan Shuttlesworth with you here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So glad you're here. Not to creep you out, but happy Valentine's Day. Not to creep you out, but I love every one of you. Eros love. Look it up. Glad you're here. I'm going to be joined, uh, theoretically, by my cousin, Ted Shuttlesworth Jr., shortly. And you see today's title, Jonathan and Ted Shuttlesworth Jr., on John MacArthur and the attack against tongues, healing, and prosperity. Bit of a heavy subject for Valentine's Day. Um, Ted available? One minute. One literal minute or one figurative minute? One literal minute. Oh, yeah, one literal minute. So I'm glad you're here. Hope you enjoyed our Valentine's Day extravaganza. Um, I'm not one. I, you know, John MacArthur's been attacking the, the, my kind of Christianity for a long time, and I'm not one to respond. But I do have a feeling that just like if you watched the program yesterday, I told you that they're going to try to brand us as lunatics from the um, LGBTQIA side, that we're hate hateful, we don't actually represent mainstream Christianity. I believe it's only a matter of time, five to ten years, that most denominations are going to marry, uh, do same-sex marriages, including full gospel denominations. Not, I won't say most full gospel denominations, but I believe they're going to start to cave as well. And um, Because if you went to a full gospel Bible college right now, tell me when Teddy's ready. I'm happy to have him cut me off. Um, if you went to a full gospel Bible college right now, most of them, many of them, I would say, and you polled the students, I don't think you would find a strong stance against the... Uh, what the uh, what the Bible calls sin. So I, th I think it's going to unwind soon, and the Bible says it's a sign of the end times. Well, just like we're going to get painted as lunatics from that side, I believe if they have their way, um, there's a stream of evangelicalism that would like to paint anybody that preaches healing and prosperity and that we speak in tongues, that we lay hands on the sick and cast out devils, that... I don't like that, and that's, I'm right to feel that way because the Bible says in the last days they'll have a form of godliness, and the, but denying the power. So bringing in now um, all the way from South Florida, my cousin and my best man in my wedding, Ted Shuttlesworth Jr. Hello? The best man, the better man. Yes, I still remember when you were the best man at my wedding getting all teared up when you walked down the aisle. I never oh, saw man. you so adorned was, in all your... I wasn't just torn up that day. I was torn up for days afterward. I couldn't even look at Adolis because of how stunning you looked in your tuxedo. Thank you. I mean, I was. it was probably a good two months before I had it back together after that. I look, you look like a minister, and I look like your cousin who was in the ministry that you're trying to nurse back from a moral failure. No. <laughs> <laughs> He's good. All right. <laughs> um, uh, all right. So I found Before this interesting. Started, though, hold on. I just want you to know I love you. Oh, I love you too. Eros love. Now, Look it up. I'm talking serious. Not phileo. I'm talking Eros. Eros. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now that we've given, uh, um, now that we've got that out of the way. You know, this is kind of an odd thing to bring up on air, but I remember, remember we joked about this in Hawaii, but then I was wondering... You know, now that it's like anything goes, uh -huh. it, but cousins, first cousins still can't get married. Not, not that I want to, but I was wondering, like, what happens if gay first cousins want to get married? Huh. Well, I'm sure there'd be people that would speak out against it and be like, you know. It's just odd to me that you're going to have like three person unions, but then like they're still not, no, can't marry your cousin. We're drawing it, the it, line there. Is my, is my audio not coming through your, on the broadcast? Oh, your audio is amazing. I can hear everything you're saying. I'm just making sure, but it's not coming on mine. No, it's, it's coming through on his. But you haven't piped us audio? You can't hear me? Uh, yeah, it should be the desktop audio. You're not getting it? I can hear you, John, and you can hear me. And yes. your people can hear me. But my people that are called by my name. <laughs> maybe it was just God's way. Me. Maybe it was just God's way of saving your ministry from talking about whether gay first cousins can, can get married. <laughs> the Lord was like, I'm going to help you out here and lower the volume. 
<laughs> I want. I wouldn't sweat it. It might be best that you, this isn't going through on on your YouTube. Um, all right. So here's the thing. I thought John MacArthur. Did, now? Uh, we've got it, John. We've got it. All right. Good. I thought John MacArthur did a new video denouncing Charismatics and Pentecostals again, which, as far as I know, he hasn't. It's the it's the old video. So okay. I don't. Did you hear my intro at all or not? A little bit. Okay, yeah. I let me tell. Let me ask you how you feel about this. I feel that um, an attempt's going to be made from the apostate churches to brand people like me and you as like lunatics that or, or like right wing hateful people because we won't perform same sex marriages and stuff down the line. I feel like they're going to want to ban, have like a government sanctioned church and that what we believe actually is not what the Bible says. The Bible's all about love and inclusion. I'll tell you, I, I have a Jewish friend and he told me that when he went to synagogue, the, the rabbi said that recently. He was saying how all church attendance in all religions is down and we all need to like come together and just unite on like core principles. So which the one world church is, is Bible prophecy. But then I also believe we're going to get it. If the devil has his way from the other side, where like people who lay hands on the sick and cast out devils and speak in tongues and believe in, in prosperity are fringe lunatics that aren't, you know, and then they can invoke like a uh, uh, 1600s quackery laws. Like they already did it. Did you know they've already done that? Like in Denmark, I did. For you told me that. Like if you lay hands on the sick, do you have you thought that too, or what, what? What's your take on what I just said? Yeah, I think I think that it's going to end up cropping from both sides. In that, um, like I think more more along the lines of Bible prophecy, because the people that used to do it, you know, where, where like Paul prophesied that, um, you know, there are people that will they'll they'll end up following doctrines of demons. They'll go away from like the true faith into following doctrines of demons because they have, uh, you know, itching ears that want to hear what's, what false teachers are teaching. And I mean, I've seen that already in my generation. I mean, I had people that I went to Rama with that are already in that place where they like left, they left believing any of that. They, they've gone straight to the, uh, cessationist reformed view of, you know, if that stuff's happening today, it's, it's like a deception from the demon from demons or the devil. Um, so I think we'll see more of that on that side where like people that used to be on fire are no longer on fire. And then on the other side, I was going to ask you this, can, is it, what are, what are the main churches they're blaming for like the, the whole like Christian nationalism? Are they like Pentecostal charismatic churches? I don't know who they would blame for that because I don't see a lot of, it's not like there's like a lot of principled churches that are in the mainstream. That, that have like national platforms that take a stand for like the constitution. And I don't see a lot of that. Do you? Well, it's like the, you know, I'm wondering if they're talking about like the Greg locks of the world, you know, that are just like, they are, know, they, yeah, him, him for sure. But I mean like what, what large ministries would, would you have, by the way, didn't Greg Locke speaking to him, didn't he come out against, something new not like liberals but didn't he come out against like like healing or or, or that that type he, of flow he came he came out against brother copeland publicly oh, kenneth copeland that's right okay so here's the thing there's not a new video on macarthur i don't really care to show the strange fire video because a lot of it is them taking you know todd bentley i i I don't have to defend everybody that's in the Pentecostal charismatic movement to be in the Pentecostal charismatic movement. Right. And of if you not. if you want to take the lowlights from people who claim to be in the Pentecostal movement, I could do the same thing with Baptist churches in sure. the Deep South that are like a half step from a Ku Klux Klan meeting. Right. No question. So anyway, I don't, I don't really care to do that. But And I, I want to say this, and I, I want everybody that's watching – now and in the future to hear this. This will probably be the only time I do this. I may never do this again because people follow your pattern as a minister. So if you're free to criticize ministers by name, 
and maybe like you and I know where to draw the line where you're not endangering your life. Um, Because it is, it is, uh, and it might surprise people to hear me say this, but like, I wouldn't flippantly attack John MacArthur. I believe it won't, you know, I I believe he was called of God into the ministry. I don't think you can fake an 8,000 person church. We disagree on on the doctrines that pertain to the Holy Spirit, but I don't take his, his, I don't take his stand that like he's of the devil. I don't believe that. I believe for what he knows and what he's been exposed to. And if all I had people was send me Todd Bentley clips and tell me that that's the charismatic movement, I'd be against it too. Yeah. But, uh, well, not, not only that, like, as you said, I don't know if we, we spoke about this, this statistic earlier, but there's, there's people in those denominations like the SBC, Southern Baptist Convention, that uh, the statistics are showing that the people that are going to those churches are people that they're not like being evangelized into the SBC. It's like they're people that were born and raised in those denominational churches. Right. So all they know is all they know, you know, and it's and, and it's it's um, it's like how I'm sure they'd love to, to sweep it under the rug. But it's like Dr. Jack Deere from Dallas Theological Seminary. You know, he all he knew was all he knew. He's a professor, professor of theology at a cessationist school. And then he, like, somehow, probably by the prompting of the Holy Ghost, recognized, I'm actually making the mistake that I teach my students never to make, which is to read the Bible with a, a presupposed bias. And when he threw that out the window and said, I'm going to start from the beginning of the New Testament, and read through and see what conclusion I come to. After like throwing his upbringing of like biased doctrine out the window and just reading the Bible for what it says, he was fully convinced that you can't be a logical thinking person and read through the New Testament and be a cessationist. Then he got filled with the Holy Ghost and started preaching on uh, um, spiritual warfare. And, you know, so it's like, if that's, if that's the deal, you know, and I agree with you, like, you know, obviously you know, going through, and I know they're, I know they're like attacking him right now and they're going through, uh, like attacking GCC and, and John MacArthur. Which, which, which is, an, which is another reason why I don't feel like, like hammering him today because yeah. I don't like, I don't like hitting people when they're getting hit. I like getting, I like hitting people when, <laughs> when, when they're when on they're top. Great. First but, thing in the morning when they get out of bed. I don't like, I don't like coordinated takedowns of ministries. No, of course not. Let, let me ask you something, Ted, because I've seen, especially in, in John MacArthur's type of churches, they're taking down people left and right for like bullying. It's not even like, it's like vague charges, like bullying. Like what was Mark Driscoll when, when they went after him? I still can't get a handle on what the problem was. You know, he, well, like yeah. mean staff practices, har- being harsh towards employees or whatever. Yeah, he actually, from what I understand, started like fake social media accounts to like fully harass his staff. Okay. Well, if let me just tell you this: if and sta- he who hasn't done that, if, st- if starting fake social media accounts to harass your staff is a, is a crime, then consider me Charles Manson. <laughs> uh, I don't. Okay. I don't. I didn't watch it anyway. Like I didn't watch the like the Mars Hill. I hate that stuff. I hate it too. I, I and didn't that's why the and Hill the- song one. I didn't watch the Mars Hill one. And, the, and, and I'm not going to watch them. And this happened, like, within the last week when we were planning to do this. I don't want to, like, let me, let me just tell everyone two things. Number one, the first thing I was saying, I don't want anyone who follows my ministry to feel free to attack anybody. Right. Whatsoever. Like, any, especially preachers. You should be very, 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 very careful. And by very, 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 very careful, I mean don't do it. Just keep, yeah. if you see something that alarms you about somebody, pray for them. The Bible says, That's if right. any of you be spiritual, restore such a one. So if I, right. if I see, like, after I do a video like this, if I start seeing in the comments, like, yeah, and he, he's, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing, don't do that. I don't do right. that. I'm, I'm making an exception today because there's, they, they portray people that believe like me and my cousin that we actually have like no argument. Like listening to that strange fire video, you'd think we have no way to defend tongues. We have no, we don't understand doctrine. We don't understand the Bible. When actually, not to like overstate it, if, if talking to them, my cousin especially and me a little could crush them doctrinally because all they do is take the low lights and this like 
cobbled together interpretation of church history that healing in tongues have passed out. What I want to do, I'm not looking to attack John MacArthur or attack Justin Peters. They can feel free to and have to attack uh, uh, us and people like us. But I want to show that if you are filled with the Holy Spirit and speak with tongues and lay hands on people and you're in meetings where people fall out under the power, you are not in a cult or a, a fringe sect of, uh, uh, well, they don't even call it a friend. You're, they tell you that you're in, in something that has rejected the faith and is apostate, and right. you're not. You are in mainline Christianity. That's Absolutely. why I want to do this video. Absolutely. Yeah, so, it's like anytime you have to deal with stuff, it's obviously always going to be a person that says the thing you do, disagree with, but you know, you deal with the principles that they're that they're discussing. And as I said before, First of all, cessationism, which if you're watching, you don't know what that is or you're listening to the podcast. That's just the, the theology uh, standpoint or view that the Holy Spirit has ceased in his operation of apostolic gifts that we saw in the New Testament, like miracles, signs, wonders, tongues would be one of those that they argue that it was for the purpose of evangelism uh, and stuff, the ability to speak a foreign language for evangelism which that is easily debunked by scripture. So is cessationism, by the way. Well, let's see, let's see, well, well, now that we're into it, let's go. And the other thing I wanted to say is, and it sounds like John MacArthur is like my father-in-law or whatever, and I don't want to get on his bedside, but I, John MacArthur kept his church open while a bunch of full gospel supposed people that believe in healing. Let me just tell you, if you think you're a Pentecostal and you shut your church down for COVID and then you attack John MacArthur because he's anti-Holy Ghost, he's actually more Holy Ghost than you are because he he actually had the nerve to believe in divine protection (laughs) legally and for his people. So I'm for that. I was going to, if he was found guilty, I was going to pay his fine just to baffle him about... Um, why somebody from my side would do it. I know he watched Check the News and wore the T-shirt that I made. I backed Johnny Mac. I'm not looking to run John MacArthur in the ground. And the more other people are now turning on him, which, by the way, not to be, not to be Captain Scatterbrain at the beginning of the broadcast, <laughs> but, th- you know, that's another reason I don't attack people by name, is he's reaping what he's sown. If you raise up a bunch of people with their fangs out looking to attack the first sign of anything that's a little bit wrong with no mercy for anyone. Now the chickens have come home to roost. They, you, you, you developed a culture of attacking and no forgiveness and you're of the devil if you make one mistake. And, 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 and that's, that's how that ends up. So let's, oh, take, totally. let's take this one at a time then. So go ahead. Explain cessationism and then you started to get into tongues and speaking in tongues. What they say and then what the truth is. So, for example, let's, let's, well, cessationism, I think, is a very weak argument because cessationism, that the Holy Spirit has ceased in his operation in apostolic gifts, uh, that's why Dr. Jack Deere changed his mind. He actually just read the Bible and said, yeah, I don't see that anywhere in the New Testament. Where would we look to in the New Testament and see that the Holy Spirit is, has stopped or is in the process of stopping? Because that's really their argument, if you don't know. It's that the gifts, it's not that they stopped short, it's that they faded out as the New Testament church was uh, established. And they'll use passages in the Bible like um, where Paul said, I left Trophimus sick in Miletus, or you know what I mean? Or uh, look at Timothy, how come he had stomach problems, you know, if, if, if there were right. so many apostolic gifts. So there's these like little story arguments, which that's not an argument that <laughs> there were people that Jesus couldn't heal. And there, you know, are you going to make the argument that Jesus, um, you know, his, his power was fading out by the end of his ministry, you know, and he, he wasn't really able to go to Nazareth, you know, and heal everybody. But it, it, it's a stupid argument. When you come to the end of it, there's nowhere in the Bible. It, it makes me laugh that these guys that are so hardcore on biblical context. When, it, when to, it comes to things to do with the Holy Spirit, it gets all thrown out the window. It's thrown out the window. How are you going to turn to 1 Corinthians 13? Uh, and say, you know, this tongue shall cease, you know, and all that. How are you going to actually look at that and not understand that it's clearly talking about when we get to heaven? It's not talking about it on the earth. You know, it's talking, that whole passage is talking about when we get to heaven. So uh, to make that argument is just absolutely foolish. 
And then um, when it comes to tongues uh, as its own argument, I just dealt with somebody about this a couple of days ago. 1 Corinthians 14, just for anybody that's watching, here's a lesson for you. If you want to defend tongues from the New Testament, do not turn to Acts chapter 2. Don't turn to any of the Acts passages. If you want to defend tongues in the body of Christ, you look at 1 Corinthians 14. That is the clearest teaching on speaking in tongues that there is from an apostle in the New Testament. And Paul's very clear about what speaking in tongues is. And because he's so clear, he's also clear about what speaking in tongues is not. Speaking in tongues is not viewed as a foreign language. Uh, though the word in the Greek glosso can mean you know, foreign language or languages or tongues, foreign tongues, that's not how Paul was using it, obviously. He obviously believed, if you read 1 Corinthians 14, that speaking in tongues or praying in the Spirit, as he, as he talked about, what was actually an, an another heavenly language. And so the Bible talks about the tongues of men, the tongues of angels, the tongues of God. So there are multiple tongues, but 1 Corinthians 14, I'm always surprised that people miss this uh, because the Bible says, he's, verse 2, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, he who speaks uh, in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. Yeah, that's true. And I, I was For actually no just... no one understands him. I was just listening on the way in, and that's what they said. Every That's what they all say. Everybody that spoke in tongues in the book of Acts was speaking in the language of the hearers to help evangelize. That's and, not true. Yeah, and it, that's what... It, you just read a scripture that says, he that speaks in tongues speaks not to man, but to God. But to God. And so the argument... That's why I said, if you look in the book of Acts... Paul, in Acts 19, prayed for the 12 men in Ephesus. They were not only not saved, they'd never even heard of the Holy Ghost. So the only people in the story are the 12 men and Paul. So when those 12 men start speaking in tongues, are they trying to evangelize Paul? <laughs> and they're not evangelizing each other because they just got saved, all 12 of them. That's right. <laughs> and baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul understood that they got what he was talking to them about. Cornelius's house is an interesting one because they all had just gotten saved, right? They and their whole household believed. And as Peter was preaching, they all began to speak with other tongues and prophesy. But they weren't, what were they, evangelizing each other? No. And they weren't evangelizing the Jews that were there because they were already saved. And they say, in the story, they say, they received the same thing we received. So the Jews recognized that Cornelius's household receive the gift of the Holy Spirit because they speak with tongues and prophesy. They're not, they're not evangelizing each other and they're not evangelizing the Jews. Um, I'll tell you, if you look at, at Acts chapter two, that's the one where people have the most trouble. But I'll tell you an interesting thing if you read the text is Acts chapter two says something that people miss. But it, it is this, it, it, when the believers, 120, start speaking in tongues, the Bible says, um, and I'll read it to you. I have the ESV here, but it says, um, verse six, Acts two, six at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered. Now listen to this phrase right here at the end of verse six, because each one, each one of those people that were from every nation under heaven that heard the, the believers speaking in tongues and each one was hearing them, all of them. That's speaking of the group. Each one was hearing them speak his own language. So that means if you were from China, you heard all 120 speaking Chinese. But if you were from Greece, you, you heard all 120 speaking Greek. That's what it says. That's what it says. So in my opinion, because the Bible's clear about this, um, the Bible is clear through the apostles, Paul. It, see, you, here's another thing. If people don't know this, you need to know it. You don't ever take a story in the Bible, like a narrative story, if there is also clear teaching on the same subject. You never let the story define the teaching. The teaching from the apostles always defines the story. That's, how, that's proper hermeneutics. That's right. Uh, didactic teaching always defines the parameters of the narrative you read about that. So if you look at Acts chapter 2, and they're in a public assembly, but... Um, Paul said uh, to the Corinthians, if someone's speaking in tongues, 
make sure in a public assembly someone interprets what's being said as the message to the group. It seems as though God is the one, in the first instance, who did the interpretation for the groups. Because the Bible's clear, they're not prophesying. They're speaking in tongues. And so as they're speaking in tongues, the only other, the only other thing, uh, unless you're going to say, no, actually, they were speaking their language. Okay, so every individual from every other nation was hearing the whole group speak his language? Or would you rather line up that story with the rest of the New Testament and as Paul said in his teaching, that if you're speaking in tongues, you're not speaking unto men. You're speaking unto God, for, and you're speaking mysteries in the Spirit, for no man understands him. So here's something that I've never understood why people make the argument. Um, they'll say, well, you know, Corinth was like a port city. It was like a modern-day New York City where they had all these people coming in for trade routes so like there were tons of foreigners in Corinth bringing in their, their goods and trading and it was a main trade route. And so that's why tongues were so prevalent because there were so many foreigners that needed to hear the gospel. Okay, if that's the story, then why would Paul say, if someone speaks in tongues, let someone interpret it? Why do you need an interpreter if you're speaking someone's native language? That's excellent. It, it doesn't make any sense. So, and then someone just said to me last week, the reason Paul said that is because he personally spoke multiple languages. It's like, no, because he also says, we're still in 1 Corinthians 14, look at this. Paul says this, which makes, which makes no sense if that's your argument. He said, um, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 14, 13. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. Verse 14, for if I pray with a tongue, this is Paul, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So you're telling me he speaks multiple languages, but he now doesn't understand what he's saying in the other language that he knows? No, he's talking about speaking in a heavenly language. And he's saying, when I speak by the spirit, even my mind does not know what I'm saying. So I need to pray that I may interpret it. Right. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's not like, well, you're speaking a language for those that are present that, that you don't understand, but they do. Okay, so then why do you need to pray that you interpret it? Why do you need to pray that you interpret it? Why don't you just have those people tell you what you said? That's right. It doesn't make any sense. So Paul's clear that people who are speaking in tongues. Okay, I'll give you another one. If you're still in 1 Corinthians 14, um, verse 4 says, The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. All right, if you're speaking in tongues... I don't care, like, that doesn't make sense either. It's like, there's not a specific spiritual edification that comes when you just switch languages. Like, if I just start saying things in Spanish, it doesn't, like, cause my spirit to be edified because right. I started speaking in Spanish. Or if I start speaking Russian, it's like, oh, now, now that I'm speaking Russian, I'm real, my spirit's really edified. It's because there's something attached to the heavenly language that edifies your spirit. Same with what... Jude wrote in Jude 20 that you're building up your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. So there's obviously some kind of an element to the heavenly language that edifies your spirit and stirs up your faith. As Brother Hagin taught, it doesn't give you more faith. It stirs up the faith you already have. Right. So, so there's something attached to this that God gave us as a gift that when we speak in a heavenly language, it not only edifies us, but it also stirs up our faith, gets it ready for action. So to argue that it's just native languages, that's nowhere in the scripture. That's nowhere in the scripture. The Paul never taught anywhere that like now that you have the ability to speak in tongues, you can just evangelize, you know, foreigners without any hindrance. Right. And, and we see that from church history. You can you know t tell about that in Pentecost after Azusa. Yeah, but that, that's what that's what people tried to do. They thought they could get a, 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 the tongue for whatever nation that they were called to. Um, that. I like the point that you brought up because that's true. It had to be a supernatural hearing of of God, what what they were saying in the upper room in their own languages. Because even if 120 people were speaking in 120 languages at the same time, you wouldn't be able to clearly hear. Like, right. like hey, hold it down. I'm trying to hear the the guy that's talking in in English telling right. me about Jesus. If there's 120, and we don't know how many were in the upper room, but there was a there was a, a crowd. Um, 
because there was 120 when it started, and then it doesn't say how many were there on, on the day of Pentecost. But there was a, a multitude or a, a, some kind of a crowd. If three people are talking at the same time, it's hard to hear what you're saying. If there's a, a hundred plus people speaking at the same time, you can't individually make out what one's saying. So that whole argument, like you said, is false. Go ahead. What are you looking up? I'm just looking at it because the other thing is uh, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But when it, when it gets when it gets to there when it gets to those other verses <clears throat> where it says uh, it says uh, twice I believe that each one was hearing them speak his own la- in his own language and they were amazed and astonished saying verse eight how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language there's the miracle how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language they were hearing the group. How, they, they knew it was a miracle because they said, how is it that we each hear each of us in his own native language? Right. And that's what the Bible says. And that's the only way to interpret it, because any other way doesn't line up with the Bible and doesn't make physical sense. Yeah, it doesn't at all. And, OK, and so I would I wouldn't look at Acts two and say this is where I'm setting up my definition for tongues. And no, that's just a narrative of what happened on the first time that tongues were released into the earth. But then. I mean, you can compare to the other passages in Acts. Here, here, here's another question. I mean, this is why it's heavily inferred that after Philip got done preaching in Samaria, um, that they were speaking with tongues. Because the Bible says when Peter and John came from Jerusalem and started laying hands on the new believers in Samaria, that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. But the thing is, Simon the sorcerer saw something outwardly that proved that they were getting filled with the Holy Ghost, which we know is an inward work. So what could have been taking place in Samaria that caused Simon the sorcerer not only to know it was taking place, but to want that power for himself? Right. It's like, I, I want to have that power that when I lay hands on people, that happens to them. Right. There was an outward evidence of some sort that is inferred because you have to just compare Scripture with Scripture. I mean, all of the other times in Acts when people had hands laid on them or received the Holy Ghost, they spoke with other tongues. So I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that the exact same thing happens here that happened in the other three passages in Acts. Okay. You know, so, 2, 10, and 19. So having said that, let's say, because you've proved your case from the Bible, that I just say, okay, all that's true, but I believe that died out after we were given the canon of Scripture. Why am I, I wrong? I would say, show me, show me where the Bible says that. Because here's the problem. The, the people, and, and here's, here's where I have issue. This is where I take issue with Pentecostals and Charismatics. And I'm, by the way, if you're new, I am a Pentecostal and a Charismatic. But here's where I take issue with the groups. They don't hold Scripture in as a high regard as those that are Reformed. No, they don't. And, and it ticks me off so bad that people can just be like, yeah, you know, I know the Bible says that, but, you know, you know there's other things we have to look no, at. Or they'll believe I, that anybody that says they, they uh, God, God came and visited me in my hotel room or I was taken up to heaven the and level. the Lord told me this. You know, they, 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 they believe anything that has like a supernatural feel to it, which, which makes you extremely open to deception. And I would say that for anybody that's watching that came into Christianity through John MacArthur or a ministry like that. You know, for you to think that I'm going to defend, I'm not, de- and, and Ted too, I wouldn't defend everybody that claims to be a charismatic or Pentecostal. At that, all. That, any more than you would defend everybody that claims to be a Baptist, because you got your fair share of lunatics too, particularly in, <laughs> particularly in the independent fundamental Baptist m- movement that's basically Or, or a, what's, what's that one down south that's always like burning other translations of the Bible? IFB. No, no, the one that's the the famous one. Um, oh, in in Kansas, um, Westboro Baptist. Westboro Church. Baptist, yeah. So, and I and you should you should have to hear that. Like for you to pick Todd Bentley out of our quote movement, which by the way, no one will have him in to preach in any charismatic or Pentecostal church. So right. for you to make him like he's representative of us, 
It, or whoever else you want to cherry pick from their 40 years on television and you want, to, you want to take a few things they said that you take issue with, okay, then you defend Westboro Baptist. Because whatever you want to say about Kenneth Copeland or Kenneth Hagan or Rodney Howard Brown, you're not going to catch them with signs, God hates fags at, at a gay family's funeral, exactly. which your Baptist churches do. So the same way, so if you, if you want to paint us as them, then I'll paint you as that. So let's right. stick with what the Bible says. Right. And, and the problem is, is that charismatic and Pentecostal believers, a majority of them, they don't hold the scripture in as high of regard as they should. No, they don't. And as a result, you get all these wacky things. That's why, like, it's so hard for me to, like, even properly. I'm going to start just asking people straight off the bat when they have a conversation. Be like, do you believe that the Bible is inspired and inerrant? Because if you don't, we have no basis to have a conversation because that's where I'm arguing from. That's that right. The scripture is inspired and it's inerrant. I so said, I said that agree, yesterday when we were watching the Church of England um, synod they were having to bless same-sex unions. You know, yeah. if you – that I t said the same thing. Number one, you'd have to agree. If you're going to say, no, I actually don't believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, okay, th then, then you're free to do whatever you want. Yeah, but if you're I, claiming I no to be a Bible-believing person, which the people we're addressing believe they're the most Bible-believing, right. hold it in the highest regard, then you have some questions to answer about the Holy Ghost from Scripture, and you yeah. can't jump out of the Bible and make some cobbled-together case that Paul couldn't get one guy healed, so we already start seeing this die out, and then... Uh, cherry pick some things from church history. You right. cannot make as that doc Baptist doctor that you 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 brought up as he found. You cannot pick this Bible up, not having somebody put something else in your head and read it and say that the gifts and ministries of the Holy Spirit are not for today. It's impossible to make that argument from Scripture. Totally, it's totally impossible. And 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 the the sad part about it is when you talk to. See, this is where you get into trouble because like with, with the Charismatics and Pentecostals, it's like what I've been dealing with. This whole thing that's blowing up right now across America and YouTube and everything about Christians being demon-possessed, I was begging for anyone, just show me one passage of Scripture in the New Testament, just one. And they couldn't do it, and they had no interest in doing it. Right. It shows you that they don't. And, and so finally a guy was like, well, you know, the Bible's good, but we have to also take into account church history and the creeds. It's like... He's like, do you realize, like in the, in the 1600s and in the in second, third century, you know, they were they were uh, believing for demons to come out of Christ Christians at their water baptisms. Like, I don't care. Like, I don't care. It's not what in the Bible. Did. Yeah, I don't care what people did through history. Like, obviously, I'm thankful for church history. I don't build my doctrine no, on church history. Because if you want to build your doctrine that Christians can have demons off of that, then let's start tossing people suspected of witchcraft into rivers. Yeah, I, I don't care about any of that. It's like, if you can't build a case from the, from the inspired, obviously, even if it was possible, the Holy Spirit didn't think it important enough to even mention in the New Testament. That's right. I said, did you ever think about this? And here's where you get into problems with people that don't believe the Bible. It's like, you know, I'm going to cast a spirit of lust off of you. All right, let's talk about a spirit of lust. Apparently, there was a dude in Corinth who was sleeping with his stepmother, and Paul knew about it. And when he said, I know about this guy in your church that sleeps with his stepmother, we need to come in there and have a deliverance service and get him delivered of that spirit of lust. No, he just told him, stop doing it. <laughs> That's just right. Stop doing it. And if he doesn't stop doing it, then just kick him out of the church. So what did Paul say? Obviously, you're Christians. You have access to the Holy Spirit given self-control. It's a fruit of the spirit. <laughs> you have the ability by the power of God to control your flesh. And Paul said, I do it every day. First Corinthians 9, 27. I do it on a daily basis. So Paul, Paul was more of the argument. Peter was more of the argument that if you're a Christian, you're not doing things because you have a spirit, a demon spirit that's causing you to do things. It's because you have not put your flesh under control and operated, walk in the spirit. You're not fulfilled the lust of the flesh. Well, you never know that if, if people don't abide by the scripture, that's why they don't know. So how is it that these guys that are reformed, that can, they claim to hold the scripture to the highest degree? You know, there's sola scriptura, which, which means, if people watching don't know what that means, sola scriptura means uh, scripture alone. It was one of the cries of the Reformation. Scripture alone, meaning nothing else but scripture. 
That's why they don't believe in private interpretation. And that's why they also don't believe in um, private revelation. Like they don't believe the Holy Spirit speaks to believers today because that would have to be on par with the Bible. If the Holy Spirit is saying anything, it would have to be on par with the Bible. Right. And, and of course, I, I don't believe that at all. I, in fact, the New Testament teaches the opposite. That in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, when it's talking about prophecy, it says, let, let someone prophesy, let the others that are sitting by hear what's being said, and then judge it. That's right. So it, it's different in the New Testament than it was in the Old Testament. They weren't stoning false prophets or people that made a mistake in the New Testament. They just judged it, and if it didn't line up with uh, what God was saying, they moved on from it. Okay, so there's tongues, there's cessationism. Now I want to get, which I'm sure you'll have plenty to say because of who your dad is and how you grew up, but that Justin Peters has a whole video, it's called Clouds Without Water, where he's saying, and they make, this is what they say about healing. They make it like Pentecostals and Charismatics go over to Africa, promise these people a better life, and healing obviously it never happens because it died out there's no healing and uh we you know ministers charismatic and pentecostal ministers just get people emotionally worked up that god will heal them but no one ever actually gets healed i want um because i want to put this on the video because i'm sure it'll get out i want you guys to get the, the the testimony of the lady that was healed of muscular dystrophy in Florida that testified the night the lady that was 97 pounds got healed. And then do you have a, what would be a, a video that if you had to show somebody where someone said, I don't believe, I believe in cessationism. No, no one gets healed today that people just preach on it, but your clouds without rain other from your dad or from you, what's the best video that you've seen where it, there's no chance you could watch that with an open, unless unless you're just going to argue anything and say that that person's lying or that person was paid. Yeah, that's why I don't even do it. Because if 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 you don't believe what the Bible says about it, you're not going to believe a video about it. That's what they do to everybody that shows it. They're like, you know, uh, these people pay these people, or he knew that stuff ahead of time, or you know, a miracle for a person that's like that. A miracle yes. does it's not, not going to help. But what about people? There are people like, for example, this is who I have in mind. I don't know if I told you this or not. If I did, sorry that you have to hear it again. But there was an 18 year old reformed guy that came to my church because he was concerned about the Instagram posts. He saw his friends posting that were coming here. They're talking about supernatural prosperity and healing. So then the, the, the Sunday that he came, I preached on soul winning. So it, it, it kind of like threw him off. So then he came, um, he asked if he could talk to me during the week. So he had three questions he wanted answered from a reform standpoint. I answered them, and he said, I'm going to start coming to your church. So there are people that they're not like, they're, I'm going to write off whatever. They, they, they've only heard that healing's fake and no one gets healed. They've never actually seen someone get healed. So for somebody like that, well, tell me, and, and then we'll argue it from Scripture too, but like I want to show... Well, let's do the scripture first, and then do you have a video, like a short video uh, from your dad or from yourself that, that it's like if you were from that background where you've never seen anyone get healed and you saw that, unless you just have a callous spirit and you've already made up Which your mind. Which is what they do. I'll right, you, but, not, posted, but not everybody. I posted, I posted that video of, um, I posted that video of A. A. Allen with the monkey boy getting healed. Where he clearly shows on the pulpit, he has that no the kid bones has in his no legs. No bones in his legs. I mean, literally, he bends them in every direction possible, and then holds them, and it cuts to the end. And I have it on my on my website, and and he um, sets him down on the stage. Okay, if you don't have bones in your legs, even if you're you know you've never walked in your life, first of all, so your muscles are atrophied. Right. But you know, if you have no bones in your leg, and someone sets you down. You're just going to like collapse down and into, into the ground. Nothing's going to hold you up. That's right. So even if he's helping him, he puts him on the stage and the boy takes a couple of steps like across the stage, even though his muscles are atrophied. People watch that video all the time. I think it's got like almost 80,000 views now on, on my website. It's like, but they still, all the comments are like, you know, I'd like to see where that boy is now. You think that's a miracle just because he set him down and he fell across the stage. It's like people see that stuff and that's the most clear and they don't believe it. I, they don't I, believe it. When I was listening to, to what John MacArthur and Justin Peters had to say about healing, you know, the audacity to, 
to, to say, which it's easy to do. It's why I don't watch documentaries. Because if you watch, if you listen to one side of something, somebody can get you to believe anything. So to sit, yeah, to sit as reformed people in a room full of reformed people and say, all these 800 million people have never experienced a healing or, or a legitimate supernatural encounter with God. You're out of your mind. In yeah. fact, I would like what to know, e e even among the reformed people, I don't believe you could follow God and not cease. It's like when John MacArthur kept his church open. I heard him say it. People are saying, I'm putting my congregation's life in danger. And then he explained medically why he didn't think he was. And then he said, also, whatever danger there is to this virus, I believe God will protect us for honoring his word to keep our church open. Yes, that's, yes, that's that's called miraculous protection. Yes. So I don't believe you can, you can, it's like Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell, one of his top guys at Liberty or at his church, um, got cancer. He called the student body together and said, I need this guy on my staff. I'm, we're going to pray and ask God to heal him. To keep. So it's, it's funny, even uh, who's the other guy from like the 90s, the Bible answer man? He, he oh, knocks yeah. healing his whole life, then gets cancer, convert, converts to Greek Orthodox, and says he's received the healing power of the communion. Hank Hanegraaff. Hank Hanegraaff, which if I think about it, I'd, li I'd like to talk to him. You discouraged people from receiving healing for 30 years, and then when you needed healing, you, well, I, I've rethought some things. You're a jerk. Because right. it's easy to sit in Southern California with a million dollar salary and a healthy body and deride people who are sick. And no, sorry, that's not for today. But then when it comes to your family, now there's a different set of rules. It reminds me right. of Pentecostals I grew up with. Divorce and remarriage is a sin. If you got divorced, you're out of the assemblies of God. Then their daughter gets divorced. You know, I've, I've thought, you know, I've thought of this. and Maybe we need to. Not the unpardonable yeah. sin. How about having some freaking compassion for people? Because at its heart, that Reformed theology is the most compassionless message that there is. They, yep. they, there's no compassion for the sick. There's no compassion for the poor. You speak to upper class people in America, and that's why, actually, it's your Christianity that can only work in first world countries where people are, right. uh, have access to health care and loans. But you... The whole reason they had the Strange Fire Conference was their missionaries can't do anything overseas because right. it doesn't work. It's not a where what we preach works everywhere because it, it's the actual word of God and the proper interpretation of Scripture. Yep, that's exactly right. And didn't they like make a change in their in, in their allowance? That for missionaries those are allowed to speak with tongues and pray for the sick. Right, because they had to because they would go to these other nations. So explain and, and, that to me as a Southern Baptist, that your healing is of the devil, tongues is of the devil, until you leave United States borders, then it's okay. I, yeah. I want an answer. Right. Captain Bible interpretation. Sense. Yeah, it makes, it makes no sense. It's like, um, it's like I heard, um, I'm trying to remember who said this. I think it was Bishop Roy Adepo. He was saying, if you come to like countries like ours, you have to be connected to some kind of power. So you either have to be connected to like uh, another religion that holds power th either, even through force, like radical Islam, or you have to be connected to witchcraft that has demonic force, or you have to be connected to Holy Ghost Pentecostal Christianity that has the highest strength and force. That's right. Uh, otherwise, you're going to die. If you're connected to one of those three things, you're going to die. You're going to die. And, and, and that's it. Yeah, and I would like an answer. You know, it is. I didn't know John MacArthur was Southern Baptist. I would like to know then how you're a part of a movement that believes those things are of the devil in one nation and permissible in another nation. Please explain that to me doctrinally. Doesn't make sense. It's 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 ridiculous. And the and the other thing, when you start getting into this stuff, just to, to start to realize that this is what gets scary. You know, because we don't just disagree with their with their Holy Spirit theology, but their salvation theology. You know, those guys, the way they teach salvation, you can never know if you're a Christian until until the end of your life. That's the only time you can know it. Is that true? Yeah, because if you understand the five points of Calvinism, the fifth point is the perseverance of the saints, or some would call it the preservation of the saints, which means that I even heard in a debate, I heard somebody say this, um, a, 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 a reform minister said, they asked him flat out, well, do you believe you're a Christian? 
And the answer was only, only so much as the Holy Spirit witnesses to me that I am. I can't promise you that later in life, I may fall away from the faith and find out I was a false convert this whole time. Like that's where you're at. If you believe in the, you know, the only way to know if you're truly saved is if you persevere to the end, you know, and they'll take that passage, you know, he that, he that, um, uh, endures to the end, shall, endures be, saved. The end shall be saved. So you'll, you'll have, you'll have that like mindset. How scary to live your entire life wondering if you're a false convert that's going to fall away before eternity starts. No, and then, and, and then I heard them taking shots. And I want to address this because, you know, they were talking about charismatics and people that believe in the gifts of the Spirit. So then they start talking about bad stuff that happened to someone. And one of them went, how come you didn't get a word of knowledge that that was going to happen? Nobody teaches in our movement. That because we have access to the Holy Spirit, we know everything there is to know and can right. yank 100% of people out of wheelchairs and clear hospitals out. Christ couldn't do it. Right. We know in part. We prophesy in part. So That's to make right. those little comments, no one even holds. You're attacking a position that no one on our side holds. That's right. like, now that I've argument. received the Holy Spirit, I know all things in advance. I know everything that's going to happen today. You know, right. how, how come they don't how come then they don't tell what the lottery numbers are going to be tomorrow? Because that's not how it works. It's a word of knowledge. It's a piece of knowledge in the mind of God. Right. And that's that's, that's exactly what we right. teach. We don't teach that we're super human it, 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 to that extent. Right. The other thing that they go off on is, you know, they they really take the most extreme uh, interpretations of of Pauline revelation, and then they paint the entire uh, Pentecostal charismatic group with, you know, they all just think they're God. Everybody thinks they're God. That if you get into that charismatic movement, they all think they're God. You know, they all, they think they're little gods walking around the earth, a and like they they totally take out of context what we teach and preach and believe about what Paul taught about identification with Christ. You know, it's, it, they're doing to us <laughs> what, what most people end up uh, doing to them, which is like not, first of all, not understanding what they believe. And that's the other thing I had to realize, like growing up. Like it, it's not, in Pentecostal churches, what Baptists believe is not even properly taught. So I, I didn't even know. I was wrong. Right, you're hearing, you're hearing one side malign another side and pre present like the straw man argument, an that's easily right. defeatable argument. Right. A and that's not fair. And no. I'm not doing that here. I'm not no. put. If I wanted to, I could put up clips of Westboro Baptist Church. And say that's what John MacArthur is a part of. It's not true. He would denounce right. that too. So sure. it's unfair for you to sit there and pop up people that no one will have in their churches it, or the worst you know, something that somebody taught one time in one message, and because everything they do is televised, it's on, which is why I didn't play the thing. I'm not going to defend the worst of what well-known people said that you right. got, got clips of. Let's talk Bible. I want to I play this and force um, you to watch it, Ted, but I want right. viewers to see it, because if you've never seen anyone get healed, it's like we, we did an evangelistic event in Sturgis at the bike rally. And I want, I want people watching to hear this. I had no plans on praying for anyone. It was a Baptist-style soul-winning meeting to preach about Christ, call people to repentance, which they did. I went to go off the stage, and people wanted prayer. Excuse me. I'm talking people have been saved like 10 minutes. Isn't right. it interesting that there's something in people's heart, unless you teach it out of them, yeah. that there's a God who can help me in my problem? Right. which is supported by Scripture, that there's a yes. God who's a very present help, not a yep. very present presence in time of trouble, a very present help in time of trouble. Call on me and I will answer you. That was right. in people right when they got saved. Excuse me, I'm sick. Excuse me, my daughter is sick. Could you yep. please pray that God helps me? Now, I'm going to play the lady's testimony. If you, There's no honest person that could say, I paid this lady. If this lady is a paid actress, she should be in Hollywood winning Academy <laughs> Awards because you, you can't do it. This is a freshly saved person that got prayer and wanted to testify, and this is one. And I had, I had uh, somebody write when I posted it, just like you talked about. Yeah, you pray on weak-minded people and get them emotionally worked up. And I said, if you want to go tell this lady and her boyfriend Right. That they're weak-minded, emotional people. <laughs> They'll beat the crap out of you. They're right. bikers that have been saved one day. You can't fool people like that. 
No. You can make or f- push them over. This was not something that was done in a charismatic meeting. This was done in 102 degree weather at Sturgis, South Dakota, at the Buffalo Chip campsite and, and, and uh, whatever whatever it is where they're having rock bands in, and we got one of the stages. So keep me and Ted on the side, and I want people to see this. Go ahead. I came last night and I felt so good. And then today I haven't eaten, like I can't eat. Four years of this pain and throwing up, <laughs> throwing up and, and I'm skinny, you know, uh, but I ate two meals today. I've had some juice. I've had a whole bunch of stuff. Everybody's like, are you okay? Why are you eating? This is for real. Like, I don't know. I don't know, like I came to Sturgis to hang out, buy bike parts. Then I found Jesus and it's a whole different thing here, right? (laughs) God is way bigger than anything. And I know for a fact today in my heart, we got lots of medical doctors, but there's only one big physician, only one, only one. And he's the only one that can do it. And he, I don't got it anymore. Like, I don't know where it went. I've eaten today. I I ate part of my boyfriend's burger. (laughs) I don't, there's no other explanation. There's really just not. Yes, I just believed it. And it happened. Like you, I've never felt like this in my life. Never. I'm telling you, I'm healed. I almost can't wrap my own head around it because it's so, four years not eating. I'm drinking Ensure for old people, right? I can't eat. I've had a whole me. Praise God. God is good. (laughs) I don't know what else to say. No, just say God is good. God is amazingly good. He's my physician right now, Amen. right? He's Amen. mine. Amen. There's some doctors who give me some guidance, but I, I'm gonna go to the big physician from now on, cause that's that's where it's at. That's where I gotta be. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. God bless you. So, so to do, I just put it, because to do a video, clouds without rain, it's just all talking and no one ever gets any help. You're not an honest person to make that argument. And that, no. that's not like our one video we found from, uh, if you watch Bishop Boyd, why are you getting your rear end kicked in Africa? Why can't you start any churches there? Because people are coming to these places in Brazil and Colombia and, Amer- and America in South Dakota, and they're having an encounter with the power of God. You're not an honest person to say that uh, we talk all this stuff and nothing happens. And then if you're going to make the argument, well, that act- okay, that healing's genuine, but it was demon power. Oh, okay. So th- th- that's a very interesting so let me, demon. Let, 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 me, let me talk about that for a second, because let me show you why that's such a, a, a stupid thing to say, okay? Because if you look at Scripture, again, we go to Scripture. It's interesting to me. When Jesus was doing two things I want people to see from the New Testament, from the Gospels, regarding Jesus' ministry. The first one was when John's disciples came to Jesus and said to him, are you the Messiah or are we waiting for someone else? What was Jesus' response? Jesus said, go back and tell John the things you've seen and heard, the blind see the deaf hear, right? What did he start pointing to? His healing miracles, his healing miracles, okay? But then you go on further and you recognize that uh, Jesus, same thing, right? Jesus is dealing with uh, the Pharisees and um, they are calling him blasphemous. They're ready to kill him for being a blasphemer. Why do they want to kill him? Because they said, oh, well, you actually cast out demons in, in the, with the power of Beelzebul or, or, or the devil. And he said, he mocked their answer and said, a, a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. So, and then he said, not to mention, if I'm casting out demons by the power of Satan, by whom do your exorcists cast them out then? They'll judge you. Your own exorcists will judge you for saying that. So two areas that you have to see in scripture. Number one. Jesus said the devil won't work against himself or else his kingdom wouldn't stand. So he's not going to make people sick and then heal people of their sickness. And have them Second, testify that Christ healed them. Right. And then which would bring other people to Jesus as it did in John 2. 
You know, many believed on Jesus' name when they saw the miracles that he did. That's right. And then furthermore, here's the more interesting one. What was the point of Jesus making the point to John's disciples? If you don't believe my message that I'm the Messiah, at least believe the signs and wonders that you've seen me do. The blind see, the deaf hear, right? If the devil could do the same signs Jesus did, then there would be no reason for him to point to those signs as the the valid proof that he's the Messiah. Because what he's saying is, these healing miracles are the valid proof that I am the Messiah. If the devil can also do them, then Jesus was wasting his time making that point. The whole thing is, the devil can't do what I'm doing right now. That's That's the whole point. That's right. When you see me doing those things, it's the proof I'm the son of God. Well said. So there's tongues, cessationism, healing, and then I want to deal with the last thing, which is the most easy thing to deal with. Sure That is. these guys think, it, we don't know the Bible and it can't be dealt with, which is the message that there's a financial penalty for sin and a mm-hmm. financial benefit for following the commands of God and living righteously. Absolutely. Now, Again, we make arguments from Scripture, but I find this interesting, and it should be known. John MacArthur, the number one thing he attacks more than any of that is what, of what we've dealt with is what they call the prosperity gospel. Mm-hmm. I want you to check this article out. Keep, keep, uh, if you can, keep us up on the side if I can still read it. Otherwise, we'll go full screen. I, I'm going to read this quickly, then get your response, and we'll wrap it up. Throw it up. All right. The prosperous lifestyle of America's anti-prosperity gospel preacher. Now, th- and this is interesting, too, because this is not written by... The, the lady that wrote this doesn't like people like me. But now you've sown these seeds of attacking everybody, and now it, you're, you're getting a harvest. Go ahead. This is February 3rd of last year. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. For decades, John MacArthur has railed on prosperity preachers, likening them to greed mongers who led first century cults. Recently, he's also taken aim at scandal-plagued evangelical leaders like the late apologist Rabbi Zacharias and former Hillsong pastor Carl Lentz saying these celebrities were in ministry only for the money. That's why, quote, liars and frauds and false teachers are in business, MacArthur said in a recent sermon. False teachers always do it for the same reason, filthy lucre, money. Yet according to financial statements and tax forms obtained by the Roy's report, this is Julie Roy's John MacArthur and his family preside over a religious media and educational empire that has over $130 million in assets and mm-hmm. generates more than $70 million a year in tax-free revenue. Before we go on, I want to be clear. He could preside over a $130 trillion empire for all I care and own 11 homes and own the state of California. I am a capitalist. I believe in free market capitalism and economy. But if you take... If you bash people for preaching, quote, prosperity and, ha- and having money, and you have more than them, you're a bit hypocritical. Keep going. Uh, but, yeah. Next. MacArthur and his family and related companies have been paid more than 12.8. They've paid themselves, which, again, I have no problem with if you say that there's nothing wrong with having blessing and the Bible teaches. But if you attack prosperity and take $12.8 million from your ministry and donor funds, and and MacArthur owns three, three, the Bernie Sanders of Christianity, where you're, that, what does Bernie Sanders do in politics? I'm, I'm for socialism. I'm for taking down fat cats that have too much money. And you find out the guy has four luxury homes. John MacArthur, same thing. You attack people for having ministers that have money and that preach that. Three luxury homes worth millions. In one year alone, MacArthur made more than $402,000 for part-time work at his broadcast ministry, Grace to You, and another 103000 from the Master's University and Seminary. This was in addition to MacArthur's salary from the megachurchy pastors, as well as book royalties and speaking fees. Continue. Also in a scenario very similar to Rabbi Zacharias, the board of Grace to You has been stacked for decades 
All right, I'll skip that. Grace Community Church refuses to release its financial statements in violation of a core standard of the Evangelical Council on Financial Accountability, of which Grace was a member. So they asked them for the financial statements. They wouldn't give it to them, and, he, and the ECFA kicked them out because they because they don't want to let you know how much money, how their whole financial setup is the complete opposite of what they teach. Continue. When I contact, yeah, so. That was 10 months ago. To date, I have not heard back. Continue. Because I don't care about them being in the ECFA. I also reached out to Grace. Uh, Johnson further stated. Now continue. Okay. Here's facts. MacArthur's millions in homes. This is an anti-prosperity preacher. This is who you morons that are in this movement hang your hat on. That you don't like Kenneth Copeland, you don't like uh, Joel Osteen because you like John R. MacArthur because you're not a prosperity guy. You're, the, you're a sucker. MacArthur first came under fire for his money in 2014 when several bloggers published MacArthur's salaries, calling them reprehensible and noting that MacArthur earns more than the President of the United States. In response, Phil Johnson posted a statement at the Sharper Iron website defending his boss's salary Johnson also argued that MacArthur's lifestyle, not his income, is what biblically-minded people should look at if they want to value his character. Bull crap. So he's saying it's okay that he makes millions of dollars because he doesn't live a lavish lifestyle. <laughs> Says who? Says That's who? That's all relative. <laughs> yeah, continue. If you own three homes, what do you need? He doesn't go to the other two. If you're only in $1 million home, you have a lavish lifestyle. You, you fat liar. Talking about Phil Johnson. Who, by the way, if you want to do proper scripture interpretation, gluttony is also a sin. And when you have your big belly hanging over your belt, you're, you're a sinner too. If you want to, if you want to nitpick scripture, he added the, that MacArthur has lived in the same house for the past 35 plus years and owns only one car. Which, by the way, the average person on earth drives an ox cart. So even if you only own one car, <laughs> you're still doing better than than most of the world. No one right. who actually sees how John lives has ever accused him of self-indulgence or even thought in their wildest dreams to describe him as a lover of money. I'm not saying that, but I am saying you got some questions to answer when you bill yourself as an anti-prosperity person and take a million dollars in salary. You take more in salary than prosperity preachers take from their ministries. It's so a million. Want- if you add up the, ch- he takes a salary from the church, the university, and the television ministry, it adds up to about a million dollars a year. That's sure. baseball player money, While yeah. it, which I'm fine with if you would just if you wouldn't be a liar about it. While right. it's true that MacArthur has lived in his home in Santa Clarita, California, since the 1980s, the property is worth 1.5 million dollars, which mm-hmm. is more than twice the median value of homes in the area. You're a sucker if you if you go if you believe this guy. I'm just telling you. If you want right. to say you don't like Kenneth Copeland, fine, because I'm with John MacArthur, who t- probably takes more in salary than Brother Copeland, just so you know. Right. The five-bedroom, so- four-bath house sits on more than two acres and includes a tennis court and a swimming pool. The home is also not John MacArthur's only residence. Continue. This should be entered into the courtroom if we're going to have this discussion. <laughs> For sure. Continue. I'll give you the loophole, though, when you're ready. Since 1996, MacArthur has also owned a $700,000 villa about an hour west of Santa Clarita. The three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bathroom home is located next to a world-class private club with a championship golf course, tennis courts, pool, and fine dining. The home is just 11 miles from the beach. Continue. MacArthur's third and largest home. Do you hear this? John, just that sentence for somebody that bills themselves an anti-prosperity preacher. MacArthur's third and largest home, a seven-bedroom, seven-and-a-half bathroom ranch on five acres in Colorado Springs was built in 2007. The property was given to Circle M Ranch, a limited liability, limited partnership owned by John and Patricia MacArthur. Weismer is a... Continue. They gave him... They donated him five acres as a gift, and he built the home. What uh, still counts? Continue. Still counts. <laughs> yeah, because that's what, it was given to me. It, yeah, that's that's sowing and re- that's what we preach. Right. Oh, oh, yeah, but the, you don't understand. It was given to me. Yes, that's what we preach. That when you give and, and walk in accordance to God's word, that it attracts wealth. Yep. So if you preach that, I don't have a, I don't have a problem if you have nineteen homes. But everything you're doing is directly against what you teach other people. From 2005 to 2015, MacArthur made about $3.4 million in compensation. 
On top of that, MacArthur also took a salary from Grace Community Church that was well that, within the upper did, medium. Did that say in a ten-year period? Yeah, so that's like that's like three hundred grand a year. Yeah, but which is way too much for how he preaches. He should be living in a Coleman tent in a state park the way he preaches. I'll tell you their side of it when you when, okay. when, you, when you're the, done reading this. This puts MacArthur's annual combined salary at an estimated half million dollars a year. And in 2012, when he was paid an especially high salary and benefits from Grace to you, MacArthur's salary likely pushed three quarters of a million dollars. Continue. In Johnson's 2014 statement, he explained that MacArthur's salary and benefits topped 400000 in the fiscal year. Um, uh, continue. According to Grace to you, MacArthur, uh, it's going back to what he used to make. Continue. <laughs> yeah, that's him. Phil Johnson, everybody. Continue. 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 I don't care that, that he has family on staff. Who wouldn't? Continue. I actually don't care about any of this except for the fact that you make it a, a big deal about prosperity right. and you oh. have more than the people you preach against. You're a hypocrite. I I'm appalled that like Phil Johnson had to release a statement when they blessed him with that Rolex for his anniversary of his ministry. Was it even was, a Rolex or was it an, an Omega? I think he already had an Omega and they gave him a Rolex, but it wasn't even like it. Uh, you know, it wasn't even like you can take the article. Like, oh man. Yeah, but you understand, like, Teddy. He should he should be blessed with that for fifty years of ministry. Like I don't have any problem with that. Yes, I also don't have a problem if he wears five. I, I, the more anyone has, the happier. But they do have to release a statement, Teddy. When you because when you, of the way they preach it, I yeah, know. Yeah, you're a I total know. hypocrite to buy a Rolex watch when you are an anti-prosperity preacher and tell people sure. they should live with less so others can simply live, and then you're full of crap. Yeah. So here's the way they get around it because I've had a lot of discussions with these reform guys on on prosperity. It's not that they don't believe, like even R.C. Sproul who was like as anti-prosperity Presbyterian reformed as you can get in his answer book called now that's a good question. He has a whole section on finances and I thought he was going to like slam it. They don't slam it. They, they believe that like, okay, so here's the question asked R.C. Sproul. Do you believe God's interested in the economic well-being of his children? His answer, absolutely he is. And the Bible shows that God cares about the financial well-being of his children and all this. John MacArthur would believe the same. God is interested in the financial well-being of his children. What they have, a pro and they don't even have a problem if Christians get blessed with things. They don't, they don't have a problem if Christians, because look at the people. You think the people in John MacArthur's church in Southern California are paupers? They're not. They're, they're doctors and lawyers and whatever else that have a ton of money that's being donated to GCC. He has no problem with Christians being blessed. When you... When you hear them railing on it, the thing that they stand so hard against is the they, they stand against the prosperity preaching that if uh, you sow, then you should expect a harvest back. That's what they go against. So he here's here's where they would stand. You should tithe. You should give. You should bless the poor. And when you do, God's going to bless you back. You just don't know how he's going to bless you. It might be with better relationships. It might be with like a uh, peace in your mind. They don't believe whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. The two things I've had an issue with in discussing this, again, context goes out the window when you talk to these people. You can take them to 2 Corinthians 9 and Galatians 6, which are clearly talking about financial offerings. The apostle himself calls their financial offerings seed. So it's not like some made up thing by prosperity preachers that we like teach people that money's seed. Right. The apostle inspired by the Holy Spirit called two times uh, financial giving seed sowing and speaking to agrarian societies, they would have known exactly what he was talking about when he said whatsoever a person sows, that's the thing that they're gonna reap. They would have known very clearly that he meant if you give finances, then you are going to reap finances. No farmer in Asia Minor listening to Paul would have been like, I think Paul means that if we give seed financially, we could expect peace in our minds. They understood. <laughs> right. They understood what it meant. And you have that, by the way, for all these guys that are hardcore uh, 
you know, hermeneutics guys like MacArthur. The, the question you ask first when reading the Bible is, what did it mean to the original hearer? Or what did it mean to the original recipient of that letter? And what it would have meant to the Galatians was exactly what I just said in an agrarian society. We understand we don't go out and plant one thing and expect another thing to grow. And Paul's now telling us that our financial giving is seed. So we should expect then, if we give financially, to reap a financial harvest. And then he goes even further. If you want to get crazy with it, Paul goes even further in 2 Corinthians 9 and promises them that not only will you be blessed with a harvest, you'll be enriched in every way. That's what 2 Corinthians 9 says. After you've sown faithfully, you'll be enriched in every way, not just financially, in every way. So you can get into that and talk about uh, so that you're you're fully in position to have a harvest of righteousness in every area of your life. That's right. So you can talk about that if you want. If you want to go hardcore on it, then deal with what deal with what the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to tell the Corinthians that it's not just going to be uh, as we talked about. What about the woman in the Old Testament, Second, second Kings four? She built that house on her on her house for the prophet. Her first harvest was that her body did what it couldn't do and had a child. That's right. Her second harvest was that her child was raised from the dead. Her third harvest was getting her property back and all the crops that she would have lost during the famine restored to her by the king. So, I mean, there's precedent for it. The New Testament teaching of the apostles uh, is clear. You know, they didn't sit around expecting people not to be blessed. How do you deal with the fact that as the early church, Acts chapter uh, uh, 4 and 2, How do you deal with the fact that the early church um, had no needs? All the needs were met because the church members were so blessed that if they even saw a need, they would take from their excess. And they would take from their excess. And if they had to sell things, they sold them and took the cash and took care of every... There was zero need in the church. That's what it says. It's not that these people are against church people being blessed. They're against the message of specific seed time and harvest they are very against that yes i understand that and and i'm glad you dealt with that but having said that if you i i was listening this morning the problem with these prosperity preachers is all the money goes to the top and they're rich you can't make statements like that no you and have three luxury homes you can't seven bedroom seven and a half bathroom home and you're preaching against prosperity, you have homes bigger than the people you're preaching against, and you take a bigger salary, three quarters, 750,000 a year. And again, I have no problem with that in and of itself. But if you you attack Kenneth Copeland and and all these other guys that they're prosperity preachers and they live lavish lifestyles, tell tell me what percentage of America has three homes that are worth over over half a million or 700,000, 1.5 well, th- million apiece. Think of it apiece. this way. Think of it this way. 92% of Americans approximately are in credit card debt. Right. So, so there you go. So you're dishonest. Whereas me, it's like someone might not believe what I believe. But I'm not hiding from you that I travel on planes. I'm not hiding. I don't wear a different watch to preach it and then slap my Rolex on once no one sees me. You yeah. have deceived people. Now, why did you feel like you need to not wear that watch in the pulpit? Because you, your lifestyle is not consistent with what you're teaching other people. And That's it's right. very, very dishonest. Yes, Which is, is why you have to release a statement. I've never had to release a statement about anything I own. I of tell people... Not. I believe in blessing. I, God wants you blessed. No one in my congregation could have enough homes for me to be happy and rent them out and be, be, be real estate magnets Absolutely. for all I care. But if you're going to tell people to live a base and to be content with little, and you have a home in Colorado Springs one, uh, and two luxury homes in Southern California that's above median price, well above what a- a- average people have. Let me tell you, everybody in that congregation isn't a homeowner. There's plenty of poverty in Southern California, whether they right. go to that church or not. You're living way. You would have a problem with a prosperity preacher saying that when it says a, a minister is worthy of double honor, that it right. means double the standard of living. John MacArthur would attack that. So would all those guys on the platform. Meanwhile, they're probably at quadruple the the, the financial standard of, of where they're pastoring, if not oh, quintuple sure. or ten x. It's but a lie. 
you're forgetting that God has sovereignly decreed that John MacArthur have those things. I guess. I guess that's what you have to go with. And and, and I want, if you're going to paint, and that's why I, I said these things to that guy that came from a Reformed church, and now he's coming. You can't defend it. They make it like we can't defend what we believe. You can't defend what you believe. And Not what you adequately. Live. And what you live. And what you live. And, and there it is, because the fruit is, you'll know them by their fruit. So if somebody truly believed those things, like I got no problem if you like actually preach and teach that and believe that and you've like, you've become like a monk, you know, like you've denounced all earthly possessions, which is what you all... should do if you preach that. Yeah. I've got no problem because at least you're living the thing that you say you believe. That's right. But like to, to, to like to go so hard and call people like demon possessed and they're you know, they're operating by spirits of evil spirits that are causing them to steal God's people's money. And it's like, dude, <laughs> like you live better than they live. You talk about filthy lucre. Much better. Like, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sure they'd break it down like, well, what you don't understand is like, you know, he's written books and the books, you know, have taken off and, you know, he's the head of. You know, those guys always do the, like the natural things like, well, you know, as the head of a university, he's entitled to this much in this region of the country. And, right. you know, it's, it's right. like, and okay, I, and I, get and I get that. But, you you know, you don't allow anybody else that same grace. It's like mm -mm. you attack Kenneth Copeland left and right for what he owns. Then they find you with a Rolex and you release a statement that it was a gift. How come you've never given that leeway to any of the preachers you attack? Sure. You think no one's ever given them gifts? If people give you gifts as someone that teaches against gifts... Right. What do you think happens to, to people that celebrate it? It's dishonest. Right. It's totally dishonest. It's foolishness. And as much as it's, it seems like I care because I'm shouting, I actually don't care. Other than if you're going to paint people like me and my cousin and my this church that I pastor and Pentecostals and Charismatics in general that were biblically illiterate and believe what we believe because we don't know how to interpret scripture, when you're full of crap, and you right. you don't know you can't back up what you say you believe. Don't make it like like I'm biblically illiterate. While you sit on a panel with a bunch of people that believe like you, you couldn't stand a line of questioning. If I came with that article, which is why sure. there's radio silence from that camp right now, because Absolutely. it's all coming out that you say the prosperity message is a fraud. Tell me what's a bigger fraud than being an anti-prosperity preacher with three multi-million dollar homes and you take 750000 a year in salary. You're, you're the Bernie Sanders of Christianity. No question about it. There's no question about it. And like, you know, you go, you go even further than that because... If you look, if you look at the way that he's not just he's yes, he has that stuff. The way they try to I, I hate this. They have it, but then a majority of it they try to hide it from you. Like, you know, it's it's no surprise. Like, you, you think no one's gonna find out? Well, actually, the ranch is in an LLC. It's like owned by a corporation. Yeah, you and your wife own the corporation. Yeah, and you named it after after <laughs> yourself. So it's, it's not like, a great job hiding it. Good, good job, genius. But it's like, you know, it, it blows my mind that like for someone, and, and, you know, that is, regardless of what someone may say, that's an admission of guilt. When you take your watch off before you get on the platform to preach. Or drive a different car to your church. Yeah. You know, that's I, an admission of guilt. I have a chrome wrapped Cadillac Escalade, which by the way, I had before I became a pastor. Mm -hmm. I don't like, oh, let's take your car to church. I don't want the people to see it. If you feel convicted about something, then it's wrong. There's not things that are right sometimes and wrong other times. It's either right, right. or it's wrong. So you know why, do you, why do you feel like you need to not wear that watch and, and own those homes? Because you know it doesn't guilt. line up with what you tell other people. Exactly you right. attack prosperity and have more prosperity than the people you're attacking. You know, I've lost respect for some. I had a guy that was like a word of faith uh, minister tell me one time. And like I, after that, I was like, bro, you're, 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 out, you're out of it. Because he, he like said to me, like as I was getting ready to start being an evangelist, he was like, now, listen, if you have a nice car, I wouldn't drive that to the church where you're going to evangelize. And he's like, and if you have like a, he's like a nice watch, he was like, don't wear that like on the platform because like, this was his actual words. If, you know, if people in the congregation see that they're going to have second thoughts about giving to your ministry because, you know, they see that you already have nice things and they think you're already doing well, so they don't need to give anything. It's like, I, even at like 19 years old, I thought to myself, that's the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard in my life. Yeah, so be dishonest. 
because right. because that always works out well to hide everything because it certainly never comes out. You know what a dumb I'm thing sure, to say. I'm sure people get irritated by the nauseating amount of photos I post with me using a uh, private aircraft, and they think I'm like showing it off or wanting to show people I'm blessed. I do it because to show everything, to do the exact opposite. So if you don't like me using sure. a plane, you cannot be a partner and not go to my church. Pittsburgh is a small town dressed up as a big city. So when I got a Lear 60 to fly my dad home to show him honor who came here to preach, and instead of him taking 11 hours to get home, get him home in an hour and 20 minutes, I posted mm-hmm. the photo. Not so I could show it off, but so if some bag, if I hide it, then some baggage claim guy tells his cousin, you know, that preacher was here. He flew his dad home on a Lear 60. That costs at least $30,000 one way. Yeah, and I'm letting everybody know. So if you want my dad to go home tired and worn out, don't be a partner. Don't come to our church. Right. Go to some other church where they don't like money and they, they like suffering. We don't preach that here. But I'm not hiding my blessing. Nor right. am I deriding your blessing. The more right. blessed our church people are, the happier I am, because we believe in the blessing. But when you tell people it's wrong to pursue it, and you have more than they could hope to have in their dreams, you, right. it is not, it's not just hypocritical. It's like borderline evil. It's, it's a it, slap in every person's face that listens to you speak. It's the equivalent of the healing thing with the Bible answer, man. You tell yeah. people healing's wrong, that it's not for today, you're not to pursue it. Then you get cancer and, and switch denominations so you can get prayer because you're sick. There's one it's, set of rules for you and another set of rules for other people. It's like these other guys, like, uh, you know, these other reformed guys, like, you know, for years you heard them ta- teach against tongues. And then, like, now they're coming out multiples of them, like, you know, actually, the thing is, I've been asking God for that gift for a long time. He's just never given it to me. That's right. Like John Piper said that. Francis Chan said that. Like What, what, you know, sh- what shows they saw it in the Bible. Right. They wouldn't ask God for something that's satanic. Anybody mm-hmm. that opens this book and does not have somebody pre-tell you something or put a filter, it is a book that the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. You can speak with tongues, and you yep. should. You can be healed, and you can have financial overflow in every part of your life. And if Absolutely. someone tells you the opposite, as we've proved, the people mm-hmm. at the top are the ones running the Ponzi scheme. They have sure. the money. You know, no the, the arrogance, but like, like the brain-deadedness to tell people, no, I preach against prosperity, but you have to understand the reason I'm a millionaire is from book sales. Okay, you become a multimillionaire writing books against prosperity? That makes it better? <laughs> I, w- I, would, I would like, I mean, I, I hate that I got myself worked into a frenzy. I would like an answer. I want somebody to answer that. How do you yeah. justify that? that that's how they, I just, I told you how they justify it. Because they're not against Christians doing well. But to tell them that every time you sow, you should expect increase and in harvest. And, uh, and then you can get around almost everything when you stand on God's sovereign decree. You can get around almost everything. Like that's, that's why if you, and, and here, and here's the crux of the matter. That's why people in the reformed camp are, are in a, in a internal struggle. It's because there are five point Calvinists and four, because the one that they have an issue with, you know, you talk about the fact that there's a limited atonement. That means that God made a sovereign choice and they don't like that. There's a lot of them that can't handle that, that fact. They're like, Oh, that means if I'm going to be reformed, I have to believe that God like made his own choice that I have no part in, but that's what they stand on. So if you're a true reformed believer and, and, and you have to be faithful to it, and I know there's guys that aren't, but you have to be faithful. You have to be consistent in your beliefs. They will believe and tell you that every rape, every murder, the Holocaust, everything was ordained by God's decree. We don't know why now, but we will one day know why. Correct. So if you want to be consistent, then that's what you have to say, that there is no true uh, free choice for anybody. Everything will happen in in God's decree. Uh, And and so that's how they get around it. John MacArthur is experiencing the blessing of God's sovereign decree. (laughs) But you can't can't argue with that. Yeah, you can't argue. But you talk about, you know, you're attacking other people for being a cult. Try to sound more cultish than that. God yeah, doesn't want you to have money, but for me it's different because God made a special decree that I can, but you can't. Well, it's Just like slap this. on some hear- sunglasses and start a commune. Did you, ever, did you ever hear somebody say this before? 
you'll never meet a reformed person. It's a, it's a massive coincidence. You'll never meet a reformed person that's not one of the elect. <laughs> right. God, has, <laughs> God, God chose me to be special. Where, where I guess our, our message is that... Can you imagine being a reformed person like, hey, I believe in reformed theology, except I'm one of the damned. I'm like, I'm <laughs> depraved. And, and I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So uh, anyway, thanks for coming on. And I, I, I just wanted the, you know, I'm not looking to attack John MacArthur, who's, no. who's looked to it. I'm glad he kept his church open. I'm glad he has three homes that. in the sense of that I'm glad that he has three homes. It's the, yeah. if, like I'm glad Bernie Sanders has four homes. But if you're going to tell people that you believe in communism and you have four homes, you're a fraud. And if you're going right. to tell people that prosperity is not in the Bible and you own three luxury homes, you're a freaking fraud. That's exactly it. Exactly and I, right. I want people, because people get confronted with this stuff, that, that follow us. Oh, you go to Revival Today Church. Don't they believe in the health and wealth gospel? Let me tell you something. You don't have to twist scripture to see that God's a healer That's and right. that he's no respecter of persons. What he has for one, he has for all. You and you crazy? don't have to twist scripture that God find there's a financial penalty for disobeying God. You don't have to twist scripture and there's nope. a financial reward for obeying the commands of scripture. Absolutely. That's what blows my mind. It's like, what do you think we're trying to do? Take some small passage where like Jesus did something one time and make that the norm. Here's the question. Was there healing in the old Testament? Yes, there was lots of it. Was there healing in the life and ministry of Jesus? Yes, there was. Lots of it. Was there healing in the life and ministry of the apostles? Yes, there was. Lots of it. So explain to me how that's inconsistent. You don't have to do theological gymnastics to see that these things exist throughout the entire Bible, not through a small little portion that we've twisted and made like into the charismatic, uh, you know, theological community. It's through the entire Genesis to Revelation. It's through the whole Bible. It blows my mind that like, where you think we're the ones that have to do gymnastics? It's through the whole Bible. God doesn't change. You know, if I'd like to hear what they have to say about that. If you don't believe God changes, how did the apostolic gifts cease? If the Holy Spirit is God, and they're all Trinitarians, so if the Holy Spirit is God, then how did He change? Right, and. And it's not something you just see that's, that started in Acts. He, he's a supernatural healing, dead alleviating God in the Old Testament. He does it through Christ. He does it right. in the book of Acts. But now, for the first time in history, it, we don't have it anymore. Where, where does the Bible it, itself say that once you have the fullness of canon, I'll stop doing these things? Right. Where does the Bible say that? doesn't say that anywhere. So why are you trying to make God change when his, when his word says he doesn't change? And whether or not, it's not like that they didn't realize they were having the canon. I mean, I know you know this, but people watching don't. As the, people think, well, you know, nobody really knew what the true Bible was until like 200 years after the scripture. No. In fact, if you read Peter's writings, Peter was recognizing Paul's letters as scripture as he was writing his letters and says it in his letters. That's right. At, P Paul writes... At, and sometimes what he writes is hard to understand as he does with the other scriptures. So he lumps Paul's letters in with the scriptures they already had. They knew they were getting scripture from God. That's right. So it's not like they're like, oh yeah, that was scripture this whole time. You know, it's, it doesn't work like that. They knew they were getting the word of the Holy Ghost. So, you know, how do we, how do we force God to be a God who changes? You know, let me tell you, people, because people will make the argument, well, you know, he's not the same as the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, he required blood sacrifice. He's still requiring blood sacrifice right now. The only difference is Christ is an ever-present sacrifice. His blood remains as a constant sacrifice. That's powerful. God, God never stopped requiring blood sacrifice. He still today requires it. It's just that Christ's blood is eternal and stays at the mercy seat. It stays there as an ever-present sacrifice for every sinner. So God didn't change from the Old Testament to the New. He's still the same. So, so now for people watching and Bible college students that, that are here, you know, if you get confronted that giving and receiving, laying on of hands for healing, um, speaking in tongues is heretical, and we just showed you from the Bible, then the only other way they make their argument is by taking the worst people who claim to be charismatics or Pentecostals, oh, so you believe what they believe, which is no way to make an argument because we right. could take the worst of Baptists 
and make sure. you worse than us. It's not Westboro Pentecostal Church that has right. signs up, God hates fags at gay right. people's funerals. It's Westboro Baptist Church. But I right. don't be dishonest. Don't paint some lunatic who claims he's in our movement as something I believe, just like I don't paint them as part of what you believe. You don't have a leg to stand on. That's exactly right. And, and, and again, they're doing the thing they don't appreciate people doing, which is like, okay, if you have a case, make it scripturally. That's why I beg, I'm begging people to give me a scriptural argument. And, and the thing is, when they can't, then they go to extra biblical evidence. Right. Oh, so you're, you're a Haganite. Right. Oh, you're a Copelandite. Okay. Okay. Go back to the scripture then. If you're different than that, I believe what the Bible says. It's just that they taught the Bible. So I believe what the Bible says. Show me in the Bible. And, and they can't. No, First they can't. All, not everybody you con for everybody that's in Bible school and whatever. 90% of the people you're going to come into contact with are not Bible scholars. So you'll probably know more of the scripture than they do. But just ask them. You know, it's like, did I tell you, John, I was, I was in Maine one time and I went into Walmart and um, this guy that was Pentecostal that was like doing a preaching a thing with me, he was in Walmart too and he was in the book section and he was like looking at this book from like a, a charismatic author and, and he, he saw me coming and he held it up like mockingly. It was like probably another one of those name it, claim it books. I went, you realize we are Pentecostal charismatics and we believe in naming it and claiming it. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't, I, you know, I, I didn't think of that. It's like, yes, we believe those things, you moron. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, pe people just get, get swayed by whatever. Thanks, thanks for coming on, and uh, I'd like to do it more often. It's, it, it, it's nice talking with somebody. I think you can end up with a weird ministry if you're just on by yourself in a studio all the time. <laughs> so it, it's nice having, like, some cross-pollination. Great job today. I love you. And uh, love tell, you. tell everybody about your church that you're starting. So excited about this. We're launching Miracle Word Church. First Sunday service, March 26th, 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. at the West Palm Beach Convention Center. We're going to be at the West Palm Beach Convention Center uh, for a bunch of weeks, but we're there every Sunday at 11 a.m. And uh, all of the information can be found at miracleword.com. And we want, if people are going to come visit us for opening Sunday, we want them to register so we can prepare for them when they come. And um, it's, it's awesome. I mean, the, the floodgates have opened up. And um, God's God's blessing from every direction. It's it's really it's really awesome. I'm like I started confessing, John, at the beginning of the year, at the end of the last year, that 2023 is going to be like uh, Psalm 118, where all we'll be able to say is it's the Lord's doing and marvelous in our eyes. Amen. That's all it's been since the beginning. So I'm very very excited about it. Okay, so how do I transition you off to your own broadcast? Since I'm just going to go to mine now, and you go to yours. I love you. Love you. Bye. All right, so before we call it a day, I, I just announced last night, because I felt it in my spirit driving in here, I'm going to do a one-night meeting in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, place to be determined, because I just shouted it out last night randomly. Phoenix, Arizona, one night only. February. It will be Friday, February 24th. So everybody that's in Arizona, Southern California that wants to drive in, I'd love to have you. You don't have to spend Valentine's Day alone. We have, uh, number one, I'd like you to, if you're an entrepreneur or business person, we're launching Revival Today Executives today at 1 o'clock. I'm going to be broadcasting right from here with Adam Lamb, where I'm going to do the spiritual side. He's going to do the practical side, actual business coaching. I'm going to give you both at this church. What paperwork do you need? How do you tangibly get multiple revenue streams for your business? Whatever questions you have. So it's today at 1 o'clock. It's free to register. And um, then 7 o'clock tonight, you don't have to spend Valentine's Day alone. Valentine's dinner, 7 p.m., Right here, 107 Patton Drive, Coriopolis, Pennsylvania. Free to attend. It's a great dinner. I mean, it's, it's a very nice dinner. No ticket price. We'd love to have you come. And then Adonis is going to share a, a, a word from the Lord um, while we're eating together. And I'll talk a little bit too. So that's it. I want to um, I want to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to give you a chance to sow seed to our online viewers. And this is my new book, Understanding the World in Light of Bible Prophecy that my dad wrote the forward to. I'm going to send that to everyone who sows a seed of any size today as a way of saying thank you, and I do thank you. Thank you. We had, I think, just over 10,000 individual people that gave last year, which is up from like eight people seven years ago. So I'm blown away. I don't know why anyone gives at the end of this instead of just shutting their laptop and pretending I'm not talking about any of this. But tons of you do, and I want to say thank you, and I pray um, and I believe that you. the reason you keep giving is you've seen God do something. It's interesting what my cousin brought up, that Paul, when he taught on giving, said you'll be enriched in every way. That's the amazing part. 
you don't just see the financial harvest come back. You start seeing God get involved in every area of your life. God likes givers. God's a giver. He likes people that act like him. So here's the ways you can give. Revivaltoday.com. Click give now. Cash app, dollar sign, RT give. Venmo at RT give. PayPal. Uh, Revivaltoday.com slash PayPal. You can give cryptocurrency by scanning that QR code. And then if you want to mail something large, which it, they make it hard to give large amounts of money electronically. Revival Today, P.O. Buck 7, Prosperity, Pennsylvania, 15329. After you're done, go to RevivalToday.com and click Claim My Offer. Thank you for your giving. And unlike some of the people we talked about today, I believe God will bless you when you give. I could prove it from Scripture. And he cer certainly has done it for me. And I don't believe God will do it for one person and not for another. I believe God's no respecter of persons. And I know many of you have experienced that. So, guys, you can play them out. And uh, the 1 o'clock thing will begin. I guess we'll, we won't have prayer online today. I'll just do it with the people that are here. And they'll get you guys can get set up for 1 o'clock. Make it easier on you. So, um, anyway, thanks for being on. I know we went a little longer, but it, it's worth doing. I don't, I don't want anybody to think that when you choose, because I grew up like this, you know, where like if anybody brought up theologically tongues or theologically healing or theologically, pro especially prosperity, well, I, I know what I've experienced. Yes, and that's good. But you actually can make your argument sola scriptura, that the, you're not, well, I know the Bible might teach against that, but I, no. It's what the Bible teaches. I don't want you to think you have to be a moron to be a Holy Ghost Christian. And I want you to kind of think you have to be a moron not to be one. 